Let's get this party started. Welcome to the 21st Annual Beer, Wine, and Spirits Summit. Hard to believe, 21 years, folks. Thank you for being here. We're glad you're here. I bet you're glad you're here now. Uh, everybody bitched about, oh, it's MLK weekend. Oh, it's the wild card games. Aren't you glad you're here now? Harry's always right. Thank you. Thank you. Please hold your applause till the end of my presentation. So we changed around the, the summit schedule a little bit. One of the things is now most people stay for both and there was complaints that it was too long. So we cut one night off and we did it this way. Now, the, the way it's going to go is we're starting the beer summit today. It goes through tomorrow at lunch and then uh, Wine Spirits Summit starts after that and then it ends the next day at lunch and then you can depart and we'll have a grab and go lunch. If you are only signed up for the Beer Summit and maybe your flight's been canceled, probably, uh, just see Jessica and she can register for the Wine Spirits. Thank you, Lord, and stay for the whole thing. It's a really good program anyway. So agenda and program uh, is on the back of your name tag and you can scan this and also get the bios. We're not gonna be reading uh, our speakers' bios. It takes too much time. We only got 30 minutes per slot. So if you wanna read more about our speakers, just go to the agenda and all the bios are there. And they're in order of the speaking, not alphabetical. So it makes it easy on you, you, you know, you're welcome. Um, one thing is we only have three social media platforms that we operate on. The first one is YouTube where we weekly upload our weekly podcast, BeerNet Radio. If you're not a listener, I encourage you to be, especially if you're new in the industry, because we just talk about a lot of things that are going on in a simple way that even laymen would understand. And that's also on YouTube, but it's also on Spotify and, and uh, whatever, Apple Podcasts. And then on Instagram, we post clips and pictures of kind of behind the scenes, what goes on at our publications. If you're interested in that, it's called Chew Pubs. And then on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, it's Beer Biz Daily. And that's where we post if there's breaking news or anything, we post it and then link to our article. If you're going to post about the summit, and we encourage you to, um, just use hashtag summit. There's only like one hairdresser in Miami currently using that one, so I think we're good. <laughs> Um, so I'm here just to set the table. I'm not going to go too big into the numbers because we have people here who are going to do that. So really there's just three variables that I'm interested in because we just got the IRI, uh, Circana numbers for the whole year, 2003 on Friday. So we have them. We know what happened in 2023. Yes, it was a shit show, but we have, there are some mitigating circumstances that I'll get into. So it's dollars volume and price and then price again. So, and then within those, we'll you know, go look at percent change and also the change in market share. Percent change to me is more important when you're looking at smaller brands and smaller suppliers. Share change is more important when you're looking at larger brands and larger suppliers because obviously it's the actual volume that's changing. So here we go, supplier performance, uh, this is for the full calendar year. Of course, uh, we know uh, Anheuser-Busch lost four share points of volume. Um, we, we know we don't have to go into the reasons why. I think we all know what happened there with Bud Light. Um, and I'm looking here at volume share. And I'm looking at, you know, normally I look at dollar share, but I feel like this year, this year meaning last year, we should look at volume share because we had such wacky price increases the previous year that dollar share is a little bit misleading. Um, Constellation and Molson Coors each gained about the same amount of volume share, um, which kind of leads me to believe that Molson Coors benefited more from the Bud Light debacle than Constellation did because Constellation was already running uh, almost at this level. Mark Anthony Brands, uh, a, a seltzer play, really held in there. Boston Beer, also a seltzer play, didn't, not so much. Heineken and Diageo holding their own, really uh, just matching the industry. And then you have uh, Kieran Lyon, which, you know, New Belgium is just on fire, uh, unlike the rest of the craft industry. And we'll have the CEO of New Belgium here to talk more about that. And if you want to say that Kieran and Paps Brewing Company are cleaning up, 
then Yingling is just mopping the floor at twice the share gains of the other two. We also had the PAP CEO speaking. So big year for most of the players. And if you wanna go down to the brand level, and this is all channel, um, again, Modelo Especial almost gained a point, Bud Light down three, and then Michelob Ultra is hanging in there. The interesting thing about Michelob Ultra is, this is a little bit surprising, Michelob Ultra is still the number one brand in supermarkets, number one. And that leads me to believe that, Michelob, that Modelo Especial still has a lot of room not in grocery stores. Coors Light and Miller Light uh, both gaining significant share. Corona Extra still gaining share like that. I'm glad that we have Jim Sabia here to talk tomorrow more about that. The rest are pretty much as you would expect them. Heineken hanging in there. And then of course, Twisted Teach just in fuego, uh, up a tenth of a share point, but also uh, pricing is up $1.72, which is the most of any of the top 20 brands. So. Uh, that's a good thing when you raise prices and you increase volume share to that level. Um, if you look at segments, no surprise, domestic premium uh, lost a share point. That tells me that the, what Bud Light lost, we didn't regain with all of it with other brands. Imports, of course, up 1.76. Domestic sub-premium not doing, uh, still losing share, which is surprising, nobody's trading down. FMBs and Fuego again, up almost a share point. Domestic Super Premium, that's Mick Ultra. Uh, and then beer centric, you know, beer seltzers lost a huge 1.21 share point. I think that's important to remember because we, we talk about 2022 is the year that seltzer cratered, but really there's a, a lot of hangover into 2023 with seltzers. And I think that goes a long way in explaining why the beer industry sucked so bad last year. And then non-alcoholic on fire, doing very well, and then I don't know what assorted is, but it's there. So here's the, here's the money shot. This is the big slide right here. Supermarkets did not fare so well. Uh, volume down 4.4%. But look at convenience. I mean, this is the channel that really sh it carried the beer industry in 2023. And you can see that pricing is up 1.67. What does that tell you? Singles. This is a singles market. Uh, singles are on fire. And I think if, uh, if you look at the reasons that people are banding about of why the beer industry volume was down so bad in 2023, you, people are moving from multi-packs to singles. That takes a hit on volume, but it doesn't affect revenue as much because singles are higher priced. So why was the beer, you know, shipments are looking to be down between four and 5%. That's the worst showing since prohibition. I don't know, it's been, I mean, Dave, you know, you, you know, your dad says it's the worst thing I've ever seen in all my, you know, and he's older than I am and it's the worst I've seen too. So is it the economy? Well, uh, the economy actually was surprisingly good last year. We thought it was going to be bad, but it, it, you know, jobs increased, wages increased even more. Lester Jones has, uh, has said that, that it's unique for the beer industry to be counter cyclical to the economy, meaning the beer industry did terrible when the economy is booming. Um, so that is uh, weird. Now, there's also, if you read the mainstream press, everybody's talking about how everybody's drinking less. Uh, but again, as Lester said, people, Americans have been drinking two and a half gallons of ethanol on average year after year after year for the past 15 years. It went up a little in COVID, went down a little after. I don't, there's no reason to believe that that's anything different last year. The practice of the matter is, is that if you look on social media, yes, dry January is a huge thing, but it looks like it's kind of a joke this year. Like, no, it doesn't seem like anybody's abiding by it. Uh, so... Uh, you know, the, the press is, is a little misleading, I think that. Now, what about Spirit RTDs, for sure? Um, we also uh, had the leader, Britt, of High Noon, who's gonna be speaking a, in a day after tomorrow, because this is a High Noon story. High Noon and Surfside are growing like crazy. We also have Clement Pappas speaking. Yeah, they're taking share, but we gotta remember that Spirit RTDs are still a relatively small category, especially with volume. 
when it uh, compared to the, the beer industry and it compared to malt-based seltzers. And so it is a little bit that, but not a lot that. Full strength spirits, no. Full strength spirits, yes, are still taking share of ethanol, but they had a tough year too. Um, and I think the spirits companies have had a real challenge in translating their full strength spirit brand names into an RTD canned package. Those brands are all down. Crown Royal, you know, all of them. It, it hasn't uh, translated into RTD success, with the exception being Jack and Coke. And we'll see how that does. Cannabis. Cannabis is just a mess, right? Um, cannabis reminds me of the wine business. It's agriculturally finicky. It's, um, uh, there's no branding and it presents itself terribly at retail. Now we're talking about the legal cannabis market. And so that's a whole mess. We'll get into that because, you know, Vivian Azer, who's speaking next with me, has pointed out that two thirds of drinkers or, or, or cannabis users are, are report that they are drinking less. So I definitely think cannabis does have an effect on the beer consumption, um, but I don't think it's all the legal cannabis. There's just a huge illicit market that's booming. So it's really hard to measure. And then there's the X factor. And I, I, think, I think we've kind of hit it at what that X factor is. There's a reason the beer industry's down. Yes, we do have a category problem. I will sit here and admit that. But we also had two huge price increases in 2022. Of course, volume is going to hit down. Again, from Lester, if you go back to 2008 and index to the CPI at 100, wine CPI is now today at 110, which sucks. Spirit CPI is at 115, which also sucks for them. And then beer is at 143. This is the metric of why beer volume is down, I would submit above anything else. Now, regular CPI is also at 143 or 46. So beer has kept up with all other inflation. It's just that the wine and spirits guys haven't. And yes, some of that is because of different package sizes and moving to RTDs, but beer is, you know, let's put it this way. When an elephant foot of Tito's is almost the same price as a 30 rack of Bud Light, people are making that calculation. And that's nothing new. So, so to summarize, counter cyclical, yes. But I would also submit for whom Beer industry index is more toward lower income people. We know this. And I think while the general economy did very well last year, that lower percentile of income earners were still hit hard by inflation. And I think that that hits beer more than it does wine and spirits. And number two, uh, singles are roaring in, in C stores. That's great for profitability. It's not great for volume. If you're just buying singles, you're not drinking a, a lot. So suits, 30 racks, kegs, all the big packages are hurting. And you know, I think if you look at the, the shipments being down four and 5%, don't ignore kegs. I, I think they've, there's, a, there's a dent in the on-premise that, that hasn't come back, especially when you look at craft. And you know, when, when you're talking about craft, look, we ha we'll have other people talk more about it, but I think the bottom line is craft was starting to hurt as we went into the pandemic and the pandemic just, uh, they just haven't recovered since then, to be honest. Um, seltzer fatigue, we still had a seltzer hangover in 2023. We must not forget that. And, you know, don't forget in 2022, we crushed a lot of seltzer. And so it never got drunk. Um, now, the TTB is supposed to account for that uh, when they release their shipment numbers, but I doubt that all of the crushed seltzer made it into those numbers. And so we're, in 2023, recycled a lot of sales that ended up in the drain. Price elasticity versus spirits, RTDs, cannabis, uh, I, I think that probably is the number one reason. People have other options uh, for getting turnt and there are cheaper ways to get turned. So, um, 
But, you know, honestly, who cares? If you look at the IRI numbers, beer dollars are still up 2.6%. I realize that's only off premise and that's only chains, but hey, we're, the beer industry still grew last year, at least in that channel. And who knows, you know, the TTB rate may revise numbers. There may be uh, shifting going on, that uh, inventory issues that went on. We don't know all of that yet, but beer dollars were, were still up. And I think that's, that's good news. Uh, so that, uh, thank you for enduring that short presentation that uh, your pain and mine is soon to be over. Um, that's me and my dog Biscuit. We're looking into the future for a glorious and happy beer industry. I really do think that 2024 is going to be a good year for beer, not just because it's cycling shitty numbers, but because the pricing will have all fixed itself out. We won't have that seltzer hangover and we just have blue skies ahead and then the Bud Light shits behind us. So I think um, 2024 is gonna be a good year. So now I would like to invite uh, my analyst friends up on the stage and we'll...